Statistics. Hypothesis testing a two-tailed scenario. The standard deviation of the population is known. You're not... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're currently in the OneNote presentation section 1980 hypothesis testing two tail STDP known tab. Looking at a scenario similar to recent scenarios, except this time we have hypothesis testing instead of confidence intervals, a two tail scenario instead of a one tail scenario, which we will talk more about shortly, where the standard deviation of the population is known, meaning that we're going to be using a normal distribution as opposed to T distributions, which we will discuss more shortly. But similarities are in that we have a population we want to find information about. We can't test every item within that population. There'd be too many things to test. And therefore, we're going to want to take a sample. And then we're going to hope and test the sample, hoping we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. Two methods for doing that. Typically, we have the confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Confidence intervals lending itself to situations where we don't know what that middle point is. Therefore, we take the sample and then we test the sample getting the mean of the sample, which is going to be the center point around which we make a confidence interval in some way, shape or form. Hypothesis testing, the one we're going to do this time, is where we think we have an idea of what that middle point at least should be. We can construct our graph around that middle point, and then we take the sample, test the sample, and see how far away the sample results are from the middle point to determine whether or not it's far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis. The hypothesis testing, therefore, being constructed in a similar way to a court case like in the United States, a criminal type of trial, for example, where you set up the whole trial on purpose because you think there might be a problem. You think that someone might be guilty of something. That's why you set up the trial. But you're still going to base your information, as we do here with hypothesis testing, as though uh, they're innocent, which would be as though, in our case, the center point is what the center point should be, for example. And then we're going to see if we have enough evidence for us to reject the original hypothesis. In our case, enough evidence that the actual mean is far enough away based on the evidence in the form of the sample of the population that we have taken and the characteristics of that sample. Now, in our example problem, we're going to be looking at another honey mustard type of situation. So we're trying to, to fill up our bottles of honey mustard because we're a honey mustard producing factory. Instead of having an external person coming in, say the government, and trying to say, hey, look, we set price controls and we can see that you're not increasing the price because we're going to hit you if you do that. But then we're also not going to let you fill up the bottles with less honey mustard either. And so they test us to see if we're basically filling the bottles up with less honey mustard than they told us we have to fill it up, even though they set a price cap and we can't make any. I'm just kidding. This, we did that scenario before, but you can see in that situation, then the evidence would have a one tail because they're trying to, they're trying to determine if the bottles have less mustard in them. So they're not concerned with if the bottles have more mustard in them. They're concerned if they have less mustard. However, if we change the perspective of the same scenario to internal testing, where we want to just test our machines to see whether or not the machines are automatically you know, filling up the right amount of honey mustard, then of course we have a two-tail situation. 
because this is how much we should be filling them up for. We'll say that it's going to be like 16.2, for example. And we don't want them to be filling up too much honey mustard because then, then we're going to be over put it, we're underpricing possibly and possibly the bottle it will explode if it can't even hold that much honey mustard and we don't want it to put too little in there because then of course we we wouldn't be uh, putting the right amount that we put on the label of the bottle so we have to test the machine and we want to see that we're in that middle point therefore we're going to build the graph around what we think it should be and then see whether or not it's far enough away when we get our sample for us to reject the original hypothesis either on the high end or the low end now we're going to be using normal distributions as opposed to t distributions which is often the case if we think we know what the standard deviation is so in the case of honey mustard production it's most likely a bell-shaped curve for the actual data because it's kind of an error calculation and those usually have like a bell-shaped curve so it's probably a middle point and then there's some standard deviation away from that middle point in terms of ounces of how much honey mustard goes uh, into uh, the bottle. So we might have a pretty good idea what the standard deviation should be. We might know the standard deviation of the population, and that will make it easier for us to use that to calculate a normal distribution bell curve. If we didn't know what the standard deviation of the population was, especially if we had a smaller sample size, then we might revert to not using normal distributions, but T distributions, which have fatter tails on the ends of them. So that's the significance in our case of, of saying we know what the standard deviation is. Okay, so let's look at it. We, we're going to do our Z distribution. So we have bottles of honey mustard. And we're going to say that per bottle, it's like 16.2 ounces. We're going to say with the standard deviation of the population of 0.5, which is known in our example. So from what's the perspective that we're looking at things from? So company's perspective, want to make sure the bottle is filled to the proper amount. So now we are the company. We're doing our own testing. We just want to make sure that the machine is doing the proper job to fill the bottles up as they're set to do at 16.2 ounces, not too much, not too little. So the null hypothesis, therefore, is going to assume actual amount is at the, the label amount, the label amount. I, I misspelled it, but you, that's going to be the hypothesis. Now, note that the fact that we're testing the machines might be normal maintenance. So you might think, well, that's kind of normal for us to think that it's going to be at the normal hypothesis. We're just doing a routine checkup. But you can also imagine that we think the machine is off. Something's out of whack. And that's why we're doing the test. In which case, you'd, you're going to say, well, yeah, the null hypothesis, I think the hypothesis is that that's not right. It's not 16.2 we would still keep the null hypothesis at 16.2, assuming it's innocent until we gather the evidence to prove it's guilty. That's the structure of the hypothesis test. And then we've got the alternative, which would be the conclusion if the null hypothesis is rejected. In this case, that could mean that it's either overfilled or underfilled because it's a two-tailed situation. So it could be on either side. So we're going to have, this is the behind the scenes data that we're going to imagine that we have that they don't know in universe so that we can make our actual population data know exactly what the numbers are, then take a sample and see how close it is to the actual numbers. So this is what we, we know, not in universe, but outside of universe. How would we do this? I would construct my data in Excel. We will do this in Excel if you want to see in another course or section on it. But of course, those will be longer presentations. So I'll just give you a quick recap of what, how we do this. We can use the data analysis tool, which isn't open by default, I believe, in Excel. But you can look up how to turn it on, chat GTP or whatever to look it up. We do our data analysis. We're going to do a random number generation with the, the random numbers around a normal distribution uh, of numbers. And the reason we're going to have a, a normal distribution of numbers is because you would expect this type of data set to be normally distributed because it's an error type of thing. Whatever that center point is that the bottle is filling up, 
it probably has an error rate of so many degrees or ounces around that center point that if you plotted it would be somewhat bell shaped. So we're going to say that it's going to be 500 sets of numbers that we will generate, which is we make more than 500 bottles, we can imagine, of honey mustard. But 500 is a large enough population for us to then take a sample from so that we can see both the population itself and the sample. So then I'm going to say the mean is going to be 16, standard deviation, the spread 5, spit out this, these numbers. So these are the numbers that it spit out for that. It didn't actually spit. It's not icky. I just mean, you know, those are the numbers spit just for a descriptive term. I don't mean some people might be offended that the thing is spitting on us, but no, it's just that's so anyways. Now note that the actual mean of these numbers is 15.6, which isn't exactly what we put in there because they were randomly generated, which should be approximating that number as the center point. And then the standard deviation of the population of these numbers is close to 0.5, but not exactly. It's 0.496 of these actual numbers. So that's going to be the, the stuff that we're going to imagine that we know. Now, if I plotted these numbers into a bell curve, it would be somewhat normally distributed. However, I'm not really uh, dependent on that because the central limit theorem will help us even if it weren't normally distributed hopefully to be able to use the concept of a bell-shaped curve given the concept that we're going to be imagining that we're taking the the mean of all possible combinations of samples all right so this is what we're going to imagine we don't know in universe but we know it out universe except we do know the standard deviation of the point the spread the 0.496 about 0.5 all right so that and that was calculated by just taking the standard deviation of these numbers okay so given that we could say, let's do a sample count. Now, I'm, I want to take a sample of these numbers. Now, logistically, if this is the population, how would I take the sample? Obviously, in real life, we would have to randomly choose in some sh way, shape, or form bottles of honey mustard and then find some way to actually measure the amount of honey mustard that is in the bottle to some degree of accuracy. Here, we want to take random numbers from this population somehow for our practice problem. How could we do that? Well, we could just take the top few numbers because these numbers were randomly generated, or we could put a random number generation next to it that, and then sort both columns, which will shuffle it like a deck of cards, or we can use an index function. This, this again is Excel stuff. I'm trying to explain how you might do this in Excel just to give you a general idea. So this was the average. And so I could then say an index function, which would just say, give me the index of all of these numbers and then give me a random number generation between, this would be in uh, columns or rows, row one to row 500, because there were 500 rows. And that gives us our sample. So however you wanna think of it in real life, we had to actually randomly get the bottles of mustard and then sample and weigh them to see how much mustard is in there. How would you do that in practice? Well, you'd probably have to weigh the bottle. Say the bottle weighs this amount of stuff. And then once the honey mustard is in the bottle, then you weigh the bottle and the honey mustard and then subtract out the weight of the bottle to get the weight of the honey mustard is probably how you do it in practice. But whatever, this is, that's, how, that's what we have. All right, so then we're going to say let's re- write our hypothesis in symbology. So now we're going to say H sub zero, H naught, you might call it, of mu, which is the Greek U, is going to be equal to the 16.2, imagining that's the amount on the actual bottle. So that's the hypothesis. And then our alter alternative is to say that H sub A, the alternative, is that mu is not 16.2, meaning it's meaningfully away from that n number, either on the high end or the low end. That's just recapping our hypothesis in like symbols. So then I could take the standard deviation of the sample. So remembering that when we think about our standard deviation, that's the spread. We have the standard deviation of the population, which we do not know in universe. We know it, well, actually we do know it. We know the standard deviation, that was a given. Uh, and, and then we have the standard deviation of the sample, which we're taking here. 
but that's not actually the standard deviation or measure of spread that we will use to construct our bell curve because we're going to take the standard deviation of the mean of all possible combinations of samples which will approximate with a formula that we'll do shortly so we might not actually even use this that's why it's yellow because if I know the standard deviation of the population, I will use that instead. If I didn't know the standard deviation of the population, then I would have to use this to calculate our standard error, which is basically the standard deviation used to construct the actual bell curve. The standard deviation of the population, I'm just repeating it here. We got that from here that was known. So I'm gonna say, which of those two numbers am I gonna use? The population one, if I know what it is. If I didn't know what it is, I'd use the sample one. The number of uh, the number of our sample, the sample count, 35, meaning we generated, we tested 35 bottles of mustard to see what the count is. So that's how large our sample count, 35 out of the population, in our case, of 500. And we did that with a count function. We just counted them, count function. And then the X bar, which is the mean of the sample, which is just going to be the average formula. That's going to be all of these numbers added up and divided by 35 in this case, because there's 35 of them. Now, remember that the average is the center point in our, our graph. We're constructing this graph based on the center point of the hypothesis, the amount on the label, not based on this center point. This is going to be the amount that we're going to see how far away it was from the center point to see if it's far enough away for us to reject the original hypothesis. So we have then, in terms of the mean, we've got the population mean, which, we, which we're imagining we don't know exactly, but have hypothesized it to be the amount on the label at 16.2. We've got the sample mean, which is what we do know. And then we have the, the mean that we can imagine of all, the mean of all means of sample size 35, which, which would all tend towards the same number the population mean the sample mean and the and this mean it, it might not necessarily tend towards the hypothesized number because the hypothesized number is the hypothesized number of the population but the actual number of the population the actual average of the population the actual average of the sample and the actual average of us imagining us taking the average of all possible combinations of sample would all tend towards the same middle point, the average of the population. Alpha is going to be 0.05. That's going to help us with our confidence level. We've picked, we just pick that number. 0.05 is a common uh, pick because the idea would be that uh, oftentimes, if you think of a normal bell curve, 95% of the data are usually within like almost two standard deviations, 1.96 or so on uh, the the left or right, which means that five percent is on the end the end bits. So that's often uh, a common number that is used. Although you don't have to use that number. So then we have the the standard error calculation. This is the actual standard deviation that the graph will be built on. So we're we're not we're not constructing this curve based on the spread or standard deviation of either the population or of the sample, but rather on the standard error, which is approximating the standard deviation of all possible, the mean of all possible combinations of sample size, in our case, uh, 35, which we approximate with a formula. Did I put that formula in here? To, to, I didn't put the formula in here, but it's going to be the standard deviation by the square root of n. So we have our, our this here. It's going to be it's going to be the standard deviation, not of the. We could take it of the sample, but if I know the population, I'm going to use the population. So I'm going to say standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size in our case, which is n. So that's going to give us our standard error calculation, and then the t-test is going to be here so now what we have here remember that the center point of our graph here is based on the null hypothesis the mean that we got is not is going to be something other than the null hypothesis so 16.2 that's the amount on the honey mustard bottle we got to 15.9 uh, which is of course going to be somewhat different so now we want to calculate 
in in terms of z scores how far away it is so remember that if we look at our graph i can have two x axes one in x's and one in z scores which are standard deviations which means that the zero point will be at standard deviation uh well zero and then normally around 1.96 almost two usually if it's a normal distribution will encompass 95 percent of the area of the graph uh in the middle so i want to convert then what we got in terms of our x our middle point uh uh, to Z's by comparing it to the amount in the middle of the graph, which is based on the the 16.2. So we have our middle point, 15.9 minus the 16.2. And then we divide that by the spread, which we're going to be used in the standard error because that's what we build our bell curve on, 0 0.083806, about, it's rounded. And we get about, and it's, it's rounded. It's because this number is rounded, I believe, and possibly this number is rounded. So we get about negative 3.61. Uh, uh, what does that mean? That means over here, in terms of Z scores, we're on the negative like around three. Remember that two standard deviations encompasses like 95% of the, of the data. So three is actually getting somewhat significantly outside of the middle point range. So we're going to say it's at three. Okay. So then the P value. So the P value calculation is going to be measuring then uh, this bit. So we're trying to get to, to the, to the, to the tails. So we're trying to say, okay, uh, if I'm, I'm going to take whatever my Z test is, and then I'm going to try to look at the area under, under the curve here. So remember that the area that we mapped out under the curve was the five percent right we said 95 is in the middle there's uh, and five percent is what we said a was alpha and then we have to divide it by two because we have symmetrical tails so we have 2.5 on this side and 2.5 on uh this side so 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 now we want to say okay if my actual number is past this critical point or past this critical point into the blue it's going to result in a p value which will actually be uh less than the the alpha of the 0.05 because it would be the area of a smaller part of the graph up here so how do we calculate that so we got then this is the calculation in excel it would be norm.dist of the z norm i'm sorry norm.s.dist of the z which would be this one and then comma cumulative we do want it to be cumulative and then i have to multiply it by two and that's because it's a two tail distribution so we've got the area under one side of the graph and the other side of the graph and you can see here that it's coming up i made a logic test to say to reject it or not do we reject the null hypothesis based on this information it's saying yes why because this 0.0003 p-value is less than alpha of 0.05. So that's going to be the idea. And then we can do uh, the next one and say, what's the critical value? So the critical value, uh, we could say, now notice because it's a two-tail, there's a critical value on the low side and a critical value on the high side. So now I'm, what I'm trying to measure then is say, what is this point right here and what is this point? that we would have to clear get past in order for us to reject the null hypothesis so the null hypothesis is at zero in terms of z's standard deviations it's at 16.2 in terms of x's and then i'm trying to look in terms of z's how far we would have to go and because we made our normal two-tailed distribution which means 95 percent is in the middle of the graph and the tails have like 2.5 then on either side then it's usually around two, right? Or 1.96 about. So I would expect in Z's for these two sides to be about 1.96. Now notice if we were measuring a one tail and still using five as alpha, then it gets a little tricky because, because there's, there's not amounts on both sides, all of the 5% would be on one tail. So it wouldn't be the same z that you would expect at around 2 or 1.96 on both sides but in this case 
it's what we would normally kind of expect. So if I did this calculation, I, I would expect that 1.96 Z on both sides. How do I get it? It would be the norm dot S dot inverse. And we would be taking the probability, this time the probability of the 0.05 probability, because I'm, I'm trying to measure the critical value, not the P value, right? The critical value point, and then divided by two because of that two tail situation, I get to a negative 1.96. Because it's symmetrical, uh, I can also just take the opposite or negative of that number, flip the sign in essence. So this would be the range around almost two standard deviations on the left, almost two standard deviations on the right, which makes sense because that would cover 95% of the graph it's, if it's a normal distribution and 5%, the alpha would be the area under the graph on the tails. All right, let's then graph this thing out. So we could graph it this way. I've been doing listing out the Z's. I'm starting at negative four and then going up to positive four. Why? Because if I want to list out how wide does my X's in terms of Z's standard deviation have to be, we know that two standard deviations or 1.96 encompasses about 95% of the data. And then four standard deviations would encompass pretty much all of the information, even though it goes on forever in theory. That's why I use four standard deviations. Then we can calculate the X for, for each of those four standard deviations by simply taking the, the spread, the standard error, which is 0 0.083806 times negative four. And then I'm gonna take that plus the middle point of the graph which is at our null hypothesis uh, uh, plus the 16.2, and that gets us to the 12.2, uh, okay, k paso, something happened. Let me try that again. Let's do this. This is 0 0.083806 times, let's just say four this time, times four, and then I'm gonna take that minus the middle point of the graph which was minus 16.2, the 15 point, yeah, 86. The, I got messed up with the sign. So there it is. So we can calculate, so now I can convert each of the Z scores to the related X's with that formula. And if I copy that down, there's all of my X's. So then I can then take that and calculate the percentages of each of those by using our norm.disc calculation of each X, taking that X and then the mean, the mean is the mean of the 16.2. And then we can take then the standard uh, deviation, which is the standard error, because that's the standard deviation we used for the construction of the bell curve. And then it's not cumulative, therefore zero. And that gives us all of our P of X. And then we can calculate uh, our tails, which is the blue bits, which means I want to pick up information. I want you to give me this information. If the Z is greater than the low part here, the critical value and the high critical value. So I want to pick up data. If it's, it's, it's in between or greater than Z greater than negative 1.96 and less than Z is less than 1.96 and I can do that with a formula which looks like this kind of complicated looking formula but if and then embedding an and because there's two logic tests we want then uh, this number z to be to be greater than the the number that we had over there the uh, negative 1.96 and the second test with the comma I want this number z to be less than the positive 1.96 closing up the and function comma to get to the next argument of the if function if that's the case if it, i want you to give me this number if not i want you to put a blank space in it and that gives us numbers which i can't see yet because i didn't copy all the cells down but it gives us all the numbers for the middle point where the, where the z's gives us the percentages where the z's are greater than negative 1.96 and less than positive 1.96, the orange area, it actually calculates the orange area of the graph, leaving 
the, the end bits of the blue area of the graph. Okay, so there's our graph. So if we look at our graph and we look at the middle point here, we can say middle point is like, boom, somewhere in there. That's, I, I was like amazed how straight the line started. I had a steady hand right there. That's about the, the point, the zero, and that's at 1620, which is the null hypothesis, right? That was our null, 1620 over here. That's where the middle point of the graph is. And then we came out to our sample at 15.9 uh, uh, in X's. So 15.9 is like, I don't know, 15 is way back here. 15 point, 15 point nine is like, oh man, it's like way down here or something. And, and if I convert, so, so then, and so that's in terms of P value, the area under the curve, that's going to be way low on the P value in terms of the T test. If I convert that number 15.9 to Z's standard deviations, just like we did with the X, it would be the, 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 or the reverse of the X it would be 3.61. So negative 3.61. So three point be like, it's even 3.5. I don't know, maybe it's somewhere. Well, that's pretty close. It's somewhere over here. It's like in this area, but you know, it's way down there. So, so now obviously that is past the, the critical juncture. So we've passed that point, which would give us an indication that we do indeed have enough information to, how do I get back to my pointer to, uh, to reject the null hypothesis. Now the critical value that we calculated was negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. That's where this line is. So, so that's around two, right? If I convert that to X's, it's around 16 or so, and then positive 1.96 around here, and that's around 16.36. Uh, okay, so, so that's our idea. So here we're saying something's wrong with the machine, fix it, fix the machine, call the maintenance person, 